As you already saw in the previous episodes of this series, the father of modern dietetics, Carl von Voigt, calculated that the energy expenditure of a fasting individual is 2,250,000 calories per day, while Wilbur Olin Atwater, the father of modern nutrition research and education, determined that a person who rides a bicycle for eight hours a day has an energy consumption almost three times higher, of 6,260 kilocalories per day. Yet, if you look closely at any nutrition facts label, you'll notice that the daily recommended values for protein, carbs, fat, vitamins and minerals are expressed based on a 2,000 calories diet. If you live in the USA, which are actually 2,000 kilocalories, as shown on the nutrition information panel from any other country that has adopted the international system of measurement. So, how did we end up with this 2000 value, which is even lower than the value calculated by Voigt for a fasting individual? Well, let's understand first what the daily recommended values mean. Back in the 1960s, during a depression in the textile industry in the United Kingdom, the Privy Council asked Dr. Edward Smith for information on how much food would be needed for a person to prevent starvation. After studying the poor and the malnourished in northern England, Dr. Smith suggested that, to prevent starvation, a working person would require 80 grams of protein and 2,800 kilocalories of energy per day. These recommendations were the first dietary standards based on scientific study. In the years that followed, several other scientists established minimum dietary requirements for people engaged in occupations involving light, medium, and hard work. For instance, in 1881, Carl von Voigt suggested that a 70-kilogram man, working moderately heavy, would require a minimum of 3,050 to 3,055 kilocalories per day, consisting of a daily nutrient intake of 118 grams of protein, 500 grams of carbohydrates, and 56 grams of fat, as well as enough water. For a hard-working man, the daily energy expenditure would be 3,370 kilocalories, while the energy requirements for active soldiers, 3,574 kilocalories per day. In 1889, Atwater recommended that men engaged in occupations involving light muscular activity, such as writers, tailors, or physicians, require between 2,700 to 3,000 kilocalories per day. Those performing medium muscular work for 8 to 10 hours a day, such as mechanics, farmers or joiners, would require 3,400 to 3,520 kilocalories per day, while those engaged in hard muscular activity, such as soldiers in the field, shoemakers, or blacksmiths, require 4,060 to 4,150 kilocalories per day. Please keep in mind that these values are the minimum intakes for a working person to prevent starvation. During World War II, the issue came again to the authorities' attention. This time in the USA, where the National Defense Advisory Commission requested the National Research Council to investigate issues regarding nutrition that might affect national defense. The U.S. government needed some recommendations to serve as a basis for food relief efforts when war or economic depression had resulted in malnutrition or starvation. In 1940, the U.S. National Research Council established a committee which, after surveying the available data at that time, formulated tentative allowances for minimum caloric intake, protein, and eight vitamins and minerals. In 1941, the committee was renamed the Food and Nutrition Board and republished the recommendations, with a few changes. Instead of recommended dietary allowances they were called recommended daily allowances, and, instead of serving as a basis for food relief efforts when war or economic depression had resulted in malnutrition or starvation, the Food and Nutrition Board RDAs were set as standards to serve as a goal for good nutrition. The RDAs were given for healthy adults, 70 kg man and 56 kg woman, without specifying their age, at three levels of activity, and for children by age groups, separately for boys and girls between the ages of 12 and 20, with the mention that the RDAs may vary markedly in case of disease and they need to be proportionally increased or decreased, depending on the individual's weight and state of health. Soon after being published, these recommendations were subsequently adopted in Canada as minimum requirements and in England as the standards for an average person. In December 1969, the first and only White House Conference on Food Nutrition and Health was held in Washington, D.C. Now, 
On a closer reading of the final report, you'll notice that the conference was related more to malnutrition rather than nutrition, and its main goal was to put an end to hunger in America for all time. And here's an interesting thing. On page 114 of the final report, we find the percent of available food energy furnished by protein, fat, and carbohydrates over the first half of the 19th century. According to the U.S. Consumer and Food Economics Research Division, the average caloric consumption per individual was 3,490 calories between 1903 to 1913, 3,270 calories between 1935 to 1939, 3,140 calories for the 1957-59 period, and 3,200 calories in 1968. Also, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in 1968, the energy consumption measured by disappearance into civilian distribution channels was 3,250 calories per day. Yet, the experts argued that the most widely used standards in the United States for the evaluation of dietary information have been the recommended dietary allowances established by the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Research Council, National Academy of Sciences. It has also been pointed out that these have often been misused and incorrect inferences drawn from such use. The RDA are believed to be above the average requirement so that, if these levels of intake are achieved, there will be practically no risk that anyone in the population will be inadequately nourished. This obviously means that most people may consume less than the RDA and still be adequately fed. And, because the goal of the conference was to put an end to hunger and malnutrition in America for all time, the experts have recommended reducing the caloric intake from 3,250 to 2,150 calories per day. The experts argued that the educational programs to attack malnutrition and hunger are too critical, and the time has come when such cooperation must become an unequivocal obligation. Thus, they recommended that the president should take and or recommend the actions necessary to require of all radio and television stations licensees that they prescribe that 10% of their broadcast time be set aside for obligatory public service communications programs of the federal government, such as the recommended nutrition education effort, and that the stations and networks should cease to exercise their present controls over which time period or how much time is to be allotted. They also suggested the making of short movies on nutrition for movie theaters in Spanish-speaking neighborhoods, educational films for schools, including loop films, slide films, and strip films, as well as motion pictures, and special films for special groups, such as community gatherings and demonstrations. For example, a film on good, basic cooking, emphasizing nutrition problems, in which the performers are Negroes, and which is therefore particularly acceptable to Negro audiences. The new national nutrition policy, the proper diet for all of us, poor and non-poor alike, educated and uneducated, was to be implemented through television and radio spot commercials, print advertisements in magazines, newspapers, company publications and the business press, cooking contests, cartoon books, street fairs, educational theater, puppet shows, women's club lectures, teaching programs for preschools youngsters and their mothers, and stuffers in cereal boxes, among many others. And, because the propaganda of events is stronger than the propaganda of words, the experts recommended encouraging and founding, through private and public sources, programs which may include novel communication vehicles such as songs, rhymes, games, TV soap operas, church or community workshops, and radio messages from folk and athletic heroes. Also, they proposed a major increase in manpower, with competence and commitment in the field of nutrition, including physicians, dentists, basic scientists, biological and social, dietitians, public health nutritionists, nurses, health educators, and food scientists and technologists, and in each of the professional schools in a university such as medicine, dentistry and dental hygiene, nursing, public health, food science and technology, or allied health sciences. An individual or committee should be assigned responsibility for the surveillance of nutrition teaching in that school. They also propose to incorporate nutrition education into the curriculum of grades K-12 of public, parochial, and private schools for all boys and girls, and to give special attention and make special efforts to include the father or male breadwinner in nutrition education activities. Any approach to the nutritional problem should be on a personal basis and not on the basis of ethnic groups and categories. Don't generalize from the top. Be concrete, personal, immediate. The problem is not malnutrition. 
the problem is this child, this man, this old person, we read on page 188 of the final report. Use existing groups as agents in the educational process, neighborhood groups, black associations, athletic groups, church groups. Work through children, reach people through their children. Find a new word to use instead of nutrition, which sometimes sounds tired and unappealing, and repeat the message over and over. The audience is always changing, and the more any one person hears our message, the greater the impression it will make on him. These recommendations were accepted by both Republicans and Democrats and things moved so fast that by the time a small follow-up conference was held in December 1971, some 1,650 of the 1,800 original recommendations had been already put into effect. In 1972, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration proposed the first regulations on how to provide nutrition information on packaged food labels and, in 1990, the U.S. Congress passed the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, which gave the FDA the authority to require nutrition labeling of most foods regulated by the agency. One of the first things the FDA did was to change the name of the latest recommended dietary allowances established by the National Research Council into RDIs, reference daily intakes, which were further used to determine the daily values we see today on the food labels. Yet, things were not so simple because the RDAs were specified based on gender, age, body weight, types of activities performed, climate, metabolic response to food, etc., and were varying with the number of kilocalories. Because writing ranges on the nutrition facts label would have resulted in a bunch of different caloric values and it would have taken up too much space, the FDA had to come up with a single, universal value for the calories. The agency turned to the 1977-1978 and the 1987-1988 nationwide food consumption and intake surveys conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which, basically, means data that came from people who tried to remember how many calories they ate. Thus, the FDA proposed using a single standard of 2,350 calories per day and requested public comments on the proposal and also on alternative figures of 2,300, 2,400, and 2,000 calories per day. Most respondents considered the value of 2,350 calories per day too high, while others suggested that it would encourage overconsumption, especially among women, given that they need fewer calories. The public's response should come as no surprise, as the FDA proposal came more than two decades after the 1969 White House Conference on Food, Nutrition and Health, when countless generations of K-12 were already grown-ups, many physicians, dietitians, public health nutritionists and health educators went through proper surveillance of nutrition teaching, and the American population was properly educated through countless television and radio spot commercials, cartoon books, puppet shows, songs, rhymes, games, TV soap operas, and radio messages from folk and athletic heroes. Thus, the proposed value was that of 2,000 calories because it's a reasonably rounded down value for 2,350 calories, is easier to use as a tool for nutrition education, and is consumer friendly. Whether a rounding down of nearly 20% is reasonable or not, the FDA ultimately viewed these arguments as persuasive. Soon afterward, many other countries enacted legislation to introduce nutrition labeling, and the reference value of 2,000 kilocalories is found today on almost all food packaging all over the world. However, although the public is, theoretically, better informed about the nutritional value of food and drinks, and the recommended calorie intake today is way lower than that established back in the 1940s to serve as a basis for food relief efforts when war or economic depression had resulted in malnutrition or starvation, and even lower than the value of 2,250 kilocalories per day, calculated by Carl Voigt for a fasting individual. The ninth edition of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, 2020-2025, reported that about 74% of adults and about 40% of children and adolescents are overweight or have obesity. Also, almost 11% of Americans have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and almost 90% of adults with diabetes also are overweight or have obesity. Worldwide, obesity has nearly tripled since 1975, and in 2016, more than 1.9 billion adults, 18 years or older, were overweight, while the number of people with diabetes rose from 108 million in 1980 to 422 million in 2014. So, what could be the causes of the modern epidemic of diabetes and obesity? 
Yet, before we try to figure out an answer to this question, let's see why scientists have chosen the jewel as a unit of energy and how much energy provides to the human body the food and drinks we consume.